Hi everyone, uh, my name is Lara and I'm excited to uh, take you guys with uh, a little bit into an emergent research project where I'm looking at the work that um, words and slogans uh, are doing within the Black Lives Matter movement in Germany. And uh, what you can see here is a, is a sign that says, I understand that I'll never understand, but I stand with you. And um, on a walk that I took with my partner one day after the Black Lives Matter protests reached uh, Leipzig, a city in, in the east of Germany, um, we saw a sign uh, more or less like this one leaning against a building. And this sparked sort of a, a very uh, interesting conversation between the two of us. And uh, I took one question away that hasn't really left me since then, which is, uh, what is the slogan actually doing here in Leipzig? In Germany. So um, I started investigating that by following the slogan through the German web, like as hashtag or however th uh, people were using it. And I found some interesting cases of organizations or individuals using the slogan. And I started contacting um, some people. And this is also how um, I found some of my later interview partners, um, some uh, black Germans and some white Germans. So um, in these interviews, I actually wanted to see how people would engage with uh, different slogans that, uh, that pop up in Black Lives Matter protests in Germany. So uh, I, I gave them a selection and we, we sort of uh, talked about them in, in particular ways. We were guided by the slogans. And um, I will get back to that. This is because I'm sort of interested in the agency of these slogans, which is why I try to use them in the interviews. But I want to talk to you first about something that happened um, in sort of a drift off away from these slogans during, uh, during two interviews. And uh, that was really instructive for me. So uh, taking my cue from, um, from my dear colleague, Rosemary Beck, who always insists that, uh, you know, nobody is, there are no, no bodies out there that are in a certain way, you know, um, everybody's like becoming white or becoming black. And those are the sort of processes that, that uh, we should be investigating. And uh, I asked a question during my first interview um, with, uh, I've changed the names here, but uh, changed it to Sarah, um, um, a black German. And at some point I asked her, so would you say that Germans would actually have to become white first in the sense that they would have to become conscious of their whiteness so that they can understand? And uh, then Sarah interrupted me saying, I wouldn't say Germans because I'm also German. Uh, and that was a moment where I was... Uh, I was quite embarrassed, but we moved on and had a very interesting conversation about this. And because of that, I thought, okay, I'm going to ask a similar question again. I'm just going to ask it, ask it better uh, in the next interview. And uh, a week later in my second interview with Eileen, a name changed again, also um, a black German, I, uh, I actually uh, had the same slip again. And I asked, uh, would that mean that Germans would have to actually become white first? And she said, so first I'd have to correct you because it is already problematic to say that Germans have to first because I'm also German. And uh, I reacted like, yes, sorry, I mean uh, the majority population. And she said, yes, I know how you mean it, but that is the interesting thing that first we have in our head that being German and being white are tied together. Well, this has stopped being the case ages ago. And uh, yeah, uh, this is this is nothing new in critical whiteness studies and um, in um, critical race theory, sort of this invisible position of whiteness and the conflation uh, between whiteness and certain um, nationalities. I uh, want to use a slightly different lens to try and make sense of this uh, one lens that also is going to bring me back to the slogans. Um, so I want to quickly introduce a little bit um, Karen Barrett's relational ontology. So for Karen Barrett's new materialism, she puts forward a relational ontology, which means that um, individual entities, things, um, bodies are not actually the stuff of reality, but the stuff of reality, our primary ontological units, are actually relations without pre-existing relata. So for individual objects and identities to emerge, what she calls apparatuses, which in her definition are material discursive boundary making practices, 
have to actually enact cuts in these relations. These cuts separate some things, but at the same time also connect others. Um, because relations, if we're in a relational ontology, always win. So if you cut something apart, you're simultaneously cutting something else together. And she uh, sort of poignantly describes this um, with cutting together apart. Um, so I just want to look at what this lens would do to the encounter that I just described in the interview. Um, and what I would say uh, preliminarily, because I'm thinking about this, that in encounters in Germany, um, there are apparatuses at work that constantly measure for blackness, but not for whiteness. So these apparatuses actually, of which I am a part, um, actually enact cuts that produce black bodies and German bodies, but not white bodies, because white bodies and German bodies are, are conflated. So there is no cut being enacted there, only between German bodies and black bodies. So um, what does that mean for us? Well, um, I would say that this means that um, participation in material discursive practices, which actually enact cuts that produce white Germans, because currently white Germans are not a thing because they are the thing in inverted commas, white Germans and black Germans, um, that might actually be our responsibility. Um, so let me get back to the uh, Black Lives Matter slogans and what we can learn from them, them in this regard and also with this theoretical lens. So you've met Eileen already. Uh, further on in our interview, we were talking about this slogan, and she started herself talking about all the other slogans, but she didn't really talk about this one. And I said, well, you've, you've um, ignored this one so far, so let's look at it. And she said, yeah, it was easy for me to ignore that poster, because for me, it's essentially a poster that if we're talking about Black Lives Matter protests, it must and should only be brought and carried by white people or by people who are read as white. So we can see here in this, um, in this picture of cutting together apart, there's a cut being enacted here between white people or white bodies who would be the ones forming assemblages with this particular slogan, word body assemblages, um, and act a cut between them and, um, and black bodies within the Black Lives Matter movement. But then she goes immediately goes on um, to say, well, I would love to take the poster with me if I went to a protest against trans or homophobia, for example. So say I go somewhere where I stand in for trans rights, then I can put myself in, in those shoes and take on the perspective that maybe a white person would have at a Black Lives Matter protest. So this I find really interesting because not only does that show that a different word body assemblage in a different protest would produce a heterosexual body uh, that uh, shows solidarity with, um, with transgender people, for example. But what is more important for my purposes here, it also, while first it does uh, cut apart white and black bodies, or white and black Germans in this case, it also connects them in a way that she now says, well, this would also make it possible for me to take on the perspective that maybe a white person would have as a, at a Black Lives Matter protest. So this, the, these assemblages, these word body assemblages also open up new possibilities of then again, making relations, identifying with each other, right? So this, um, this I found very interesting. So um, yeah, so, so what? Like, so in my research, I'm trying to conceptualize difference as this, this practice of cutting together apart. Um, boundaries are iteratively reconfigured and whichever divisions they create are simultaneously also connections. So there might be racialization happening in that there are actually white German bodies emerging and not only black bodies, but actually black German bodies and white German bodies. This is a process of racialization, of cutting, but this cutting also connects via now a shared racialization. Um, so this I find interesting. And yeah, I would like to sort of um, leave you with, with this question of what this might actually open up new ways of seeing and hearing the other and whether or not we might be observing actually a productive racialization going on in Germany.
yeah, looking forward to seeing you uh, in the seminar. <laughs>